Located on the Parito Plateau, Los Alamos is a picturesque town perched on a mesa in northern New Mexico. It was once home to Pueblo villages, ranches, and homesteads. The surrounding land was used for hunting, gathering, farming, and ranching for nearly a thousand years. Similar to Hanford and Oak Ridge though, this area went through rapid changes as it was selected as a site for the Manhattan Project. Hey everyone, my name is Isaac and I live in Los Alamos in northern New Mexico. Today I'm at the Bradbury Science Museum at Los Alamos National Laboratories. I'm joined today with Elliot Schultz, a historian of science at the museum, who's hopefully going to share a couple stories of the town and the lab. Thank you for joining me. Pleasure to be here, Isaac. So why was this area chosen for the lab? So the reason why Los Alamos was chosen is very similar to the stories of Oak Ridge and Hanford. Uh, the military needed a place that was remote and isolated where scientists and engineers could come together to uh, solve very serious technical problems related to the development of the atomic bomb. And while many scientists and engineers throughout Europe and the United States were confident that an atomic bomb could be constructed, a lot of the research was very slow and disorganized. And so General Groves thought that everybody should come together in one central location where this research could be done. And why don't we go into the town of Los Alamos and we can talk a little bit more about the history of how this laboratory was founded. Sounds good. So behind us here is Fuller Lodge, which was actually part of the Los Alamos Ranch School, a uh, school for wealthy boys uh, in the early 1900s. And it was this building, and there were a lot of other buildings in the area, mainly homesteads from people that were living down halfway between Los Alamos and Santa Fe, that formed more or less Los Alamos before the Manhattan Project came in 1943. So who was Oppenheimer and what did he do? So Oppenheimer was actually the director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, and he was one of the most prominent theoretical physicists in the country. Uh, compared to Leslie Groves, who is the military leader of the Manhattan Project, uh, Oppenheimer was almost his complete opposite. Whereas uh, Groves was this real hard-driving military man who was always you know, striving to make sure that he was under budget and ahead of schedule with his deadlines, mm -hmm. Oppenheimer was a bit more charismatic. He was always one person that would entertain multiple approaches to a problem and was always willing to seek out compromise. But between the two of them, uh, Groves really saw in Oppenheimer this person that wanted to participate and wanted to contribute to the war effort. So how did the area change with all these new residents arriving here? In short, it changed a lot. Oppenheimer's job was to recruit the brightest minds from universities throughout the country to Los Alamos convincing folks to move their families to a remote location to work on a government project that he couldn't elaborate, however, was a challenging task. Many scientists were accompanied by their families, which produced its own problems because Los Alamos was a military installation without the amenities of a normal town. In spite of the rush construction and the need for secrecy, a sense of community quickly formed. One of the biggest challenges with all of this construction was trying to make this place secure. And I want to show you an area, it's a little bit of a reconstruction of how they kept this area secure during the middle of wartime. Let's do it. So with all these new residents arriving here, how did they manage to keep it all a secret? Well, take a look at the building behind us. This is a reconstruction of uh, a guard station that replicates one of the most famous photos of wartime Los Alamos. Of course, General Groves was a master of compartmentalizing every aspect of the Manhattan Project. Of the 130,000 people that were working throughout the nation on the Manhattan Project, people were pretty much relegated to knowing only what they were working on. And that also applied in here in Los Alamos because once you pass this guard station, this wasn't the only gate and this wasn't the only fence. In fact, once you got in, there were individual laboratories that were also fenced in as well that you had to go through other guard stations. Okay every bit of this was designed to keep things as secret as possible. You keep free exchange inside, but total secrecy outside. 
Well, why don't we go back to the Bradbury and we can talk a little bit more about the science that was being done during the Let's Manhattan do it. Project. So fuel for the bombs was being made in Washington and Tennessee. What exactly was going on here? Well, scientists at Los Alamos were confident that they could use uh, both uranium and plutonium to sustain a chain reaction to produce an explosion. A lot of science and a lot of engineering needed to be done in order to actually start that chain reaction. And the majority of that research was actually being done here in Los Alamos. In the end, they would eventually choose two types of ways to assemble this fuel uh, to produce this explosion, what are known as the gun method and uh, the implosion method. And Los Alamos scientists would actually use both. Now the gun assembly is actually very simple. You basically take one piece of uranium and you shoot it through a gun into another piece, it assembles and produces an explosion. While implosion is a bit more complicated. You take a sphere of material and high explosives surrounding it. You compress it together and that produces a chain reaction. And so this bomb in front of us, little boy, this was the gun assembly and behind me is Fat Man. That was actually the implosion assembly. But of course it wasn't just figuring out the assemblies that was important. There was also the mechanisms behind making sure that these reactions worked. And that included a lot of material science and a lot of electronics engineering. About a four hour drive from Los Alamos, the Alamogordo bombing range, now called the White Sands Missile Range, was pinpointed as the test site. The nearest town was 20 miles from ground zero. Even still, Groves was extremely concerned about the after effects of the blast. He had intelligence agents locate and map everyone living within a 40 mile radius of the site. Engineers constructed a 100 foot steel tower with the bomb, nicknamed Gadget, placed on top. The bomb containing plutonium from Hanford would be detonated by the implosion method. There was still much anxiety swirling around the prospect of the first nuclear detonation in Los Alamos. The now president, Harry Truman, awaited news of the test, which would inform his actions and decisions at the Potsdam Conference with other allied leaders a day later. Despite uncooperative weather, conflicting experimental results, fears and reservations from scientists, and mishaps at the site, the world changed at 5.29 a.m. on July 16, 1945. In the first fractions of a second, the astounding power of the fissioning atoms weren't visible to the naked eye until a bright and blinding flash of light burst forward. What would come next was a red-orange fireball, hotter than the sun's surface, which flattened and rose into a distinctive mushroom cloud. Years later, Oppenheimer reflected on the moment. He fittingly quoted a famous Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death the destroyer of worlds. Oppenheimer understood that this new power unleashed by humanity would not only influence the war's end, but impact life on this planet forever. <laughs>